Hi, everybody. In case you don't know me, I'm Albert. Been around for a minute. And uh, I get to be the first designated hitter in the lineup for the next three weeks. So, uh, yikes. But praise God. Let's, uh, let's go before him in prayer. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you because you are incredible. You're able to do things beyond our knowing and understanding. You were there from the beginning and you're there to the end. And Lord, we ask you even now to be the center of our focus. That Lord, you would settle our hearts. That you'd prepare us, Lord, to receive that which you have written for our understanding. And that, Father, you would take these words and you'd use them to build us up. To take down those things that hold us back from walking and serving, Lord. And to strengthen your body. We thank you, Father, and we praise you. We ask that you would bless your word this morning as we share it together. And we give you all the glory, and we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. All right. <clears throat> it was some years ago, I used to, uh, I had a side business doing uh, event photography. And I would get invited very often to go to these places and do pictures for celebrities who were having a, some type of either a, a thing happening with them. And very often there would be these people where you would go, they wrote a book. And they wrote some book that impressed people, and so they would have a book signing. And people would line up. And I'd have maybe three or four hours worth of this job where I would just shoot pictures all day. you get 30 seconds to meet the author. You would sit in a line sometimes for two hours. I would watch people waiting with a book in hand, and it, and it would just two steps, two steps every five minutes. And then you would walk in. And you would put your book in front of the person and tell them how much you love them and how much their words change your life. And they're looking at you going, mm -hmm, yeah, it's great, wonderful. They'll never see you again. They don't care about you except that you bought their book. I know that because I sat in that room with three hours and they said the exact same thing to everybody who went in there. And then they would sign the book. Who am I signing this to? And then the people would walk out as though their life was changed because they met the author. And I think... Well, that's, that, I guess that's cool. If you see somebody in life that you really admire and you've seen their work but you've never met them personally and now you get all excited, that's a thing. That's a thing we do as human beings. And yet, when we consider what we carry around with us every single day, I don't know that you understand what we hold, but I want to encourage you in this way. That what you hold is not a book, but it is 66 books, 40 different authors, over 1,500 years, and it's gathering and writing. None of these, none of these contradict, none of these words contradict each other. All talking about the same thing. Collected and written by what some would argue are human beings who did all of this writing, and yet the claim of itself is that its author is not the people. And so today, what I would like to do is to introduce you to the author of the very book we carry around and we call the Bible. Long time ago, somebody told me that if you took the Bible as an acronym, it's your basic instructions before leaving earth. And I thought that was clever when I first heard it. But the truth is, it's something bigger than that. It's not even about instructions you're supposed to have here, though there are instructions in there for us. This is really a book that from beginning to end teaches us about the God of the universe, reveals him from the very beginning to the very end. The author of this book comes from outside of our existence, according to what the scriptures read, and I want to introduce him to you. So if you would, with me, go with, uh, in your Bible, open it up to the Gospel of John. And we're going to start in verse 1. Now, the Gospel of John, if you're not familiar with it, I hope you are, but if you're not, there's four Gospels. I said there are 66 books, 40 different authors, and in the New Testament alone, there's four Gospels. And you think, well, why is there four? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all written from different perspectives about the life of Jesus. Matthew, when he starts his story, he starts out with the genealogy of Jesus, and he talks about he takes them back to Abraham, and it's so that the Jewish believers would understand the lineage from which Christ came. Because according to the Old Testament scripture, for Jesus to be who he claimed to be, there, there should have been a 
birth model that you can follow. And so Matthew covers that. Luke starts at a whole different place. Luke, if you will, starts with the birth of John the Baptist. And he starts there. He tells the story and then gets into the birth of Jesus and tells about the interaction of the family. Mark approaches it right at the beginning of, of Jesus' ministry as he sees it with John the baptism and the baptism uh, of Jesus Christ right there in the beginning. And you take each of these stories and you lay them out and you see different angles of who Jesus is. John starts in a different place. Each of them started in a beginning from a different spot. John writes this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pause there for just a second. In the beginning, what beginning is he talking about? Well, in the beginning, if we can say, well, is he in the, talking about the beginning of when Jesus was born? Of course, there's that beginning. Or when uh, the beginning of John the Baptist and that ministry, yeah, that was the beginning. He was there. Is he talking about Genesis 1-1 where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Ooh. Yeah, he was there at that beginning. But I suggest to you this beginning that he's talking to you about is even before that. He's saying that in the beginning, when there was a beginning, because you and I don't have the concept of no beginning, because to us, everything has a beginning and an end. We've only known beginnings and end. We only know we have a beginning. We might be afraid of that end, but we have one. If you've ever had pets, how many of you have pets? Pets have a beginning and an end. That's how it works. They live less than us. Everything has a beginning. Everything has an end. And to us to have the concept that God has no beginning and end. He is. Jesus said what? I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. There is an outside. So when we talk about the word was in the beginning, he was in that beginning before time started, before our, con our concept of a beginning. He is the beginning. And not only was the word, by the way, that is a play really for the Greeks, because the Greeks had this idea of the logos. And the logos in, in, in Greek teaching was this, that man has ideas. And that idea is the logos. And the logos, once you put it into, you frame it out somehow, either in word or in writing, and then it becomes a thing. And that live thing, that logos, becomes your idea into, say you want to make a birdhouse. Nobody's heard of one before. And so you go out and you tell people, I'm going to make a birdhouse. Why? Well, it's a little house that I can have in my yard where birds can live. Well, birds live in trees. Why would you? You couldn't even conceive of a, a house until I drew it. And now all of a sudden my concept comes out and it's constructed and it's a house and birds live in it. And now you get it. But before that, you didn't know. That was the idea. The logos was an idea that was in people's minds and had to come out. And here John uses that idea. The idea of the beginning, the idea of creation, everything that was started right here with the word. And the word was with God. Here's the crazier part. The word was God. I don't know that we can make that jump fully in our minds all the time because his, it was God. Now, those in opposition of this concept add in a little... A little thing called an A right before that in their scriptures. They call it the interpretation of the Holy Scriptures to change the whole meaning. He was a God. Okay. If we took that idea, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. He was with God, and he was a God. Well, then he would have to be a false God if he wasn't the God. Because there is no other God according to Scripture. There's only one. That's what it says. So if the word was God and he wasn't a God, he was the God. So here is God with himself and he's the word or an idea of about something that's about to happen called creation. So he was with God in the beginning and he was God. That's an important piece to us as believers, by the way, because if Jesus is just a good guy and a good guy died and he wasn't God, we're hopeless in our sins. We have, we have no redemption. That's what the scripture teaches. So step one is understanding who this author is. This author is God himself. He became flesh. Let's keep reading. 
He was in the beginning with God. Here's an amazing thing about him. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made through him, and anything that was made wasn't made without him. So what is all? Well, let's think about that for a minute, because we have great imaginations. Um, Did he make wood? Yeah, he made trees. Did he make stones? Yep, he made stones. Did he make the mountains? Yeah, he made the mountains. Did he make everything we can see? Yes. He even made things we can't see. Man and his great ideas of how smart we are go into this thing called the microverse. We get really good with our microscopes and we dig deep and we find really deep, crazy things. And science has revealed to us some very, very deep things about creation. For instance, did you know that... This, that we call solid matter, is a lot less solid than you think. That in here are these vibrating little pieces of matter and antimatter all working together to help us perceive what wood is. And the difference between wood and carpet versus stone is some type of vibration difference. And then you read in the scriptures where it says that the Lord holds all of that together in his hand. That nothing can hold together without him holding it together. And as science digs into the microverse and they get deeper and deeper, they get bigger questions like, we get to a certain point where we really don't understand how it holds it together, but something holds it together. And yet we have the answer. It's amazing to me. Did he make atoms? Yeah, he made atoms. He made the microverse, the things that we're just now discovering. He made those things. He made the universe outside, the macroverse, when you leave the earth and its space and you see the galaxies are beyond our understanding and depth. We haven't found the end of it yet. He made all of that. All that we're discovering, we're going, look how marvelous we are. We discovered this stuff. And he's going, I made it. And you're marveling, as the scripture says, right? that we get all impressed with the things of creation and we forget the creator. The author of our book is God. He created everything and every single thing that is made that we don't even know yet, that you are just discovering, he was intricately involved with. That should shake you and go, whoa. Give you a minute. All things, nothing that was made was not made without him. Everything. You can think of it. He did it. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. It's interesting because as you start to understand what we're walking through here, the better you understand God, it should also change your perception of yourself. It should change your perception of the world around you. It should change your perception of what we call enlightenment. It says that in him was life, and that life was the light of men. When we talk about what life is, I can tell you this. We all have this in common. We might not have a lot of things in common, but I know we have this one thing in common. We got here the same way. Somewhere in the spectrum of time and space, we poked our head out of a very dark hole with no previous reference to this place, showed up on this planet and been trying to figure out what's going on ever since. We all got here that way. And we only had the people around us, we call them family, to tell us what was up. But what if they were wrong? We don't consider those things because we consider that experience. We consider somehow our experience as the truth of life. And he says, no, in the life in him was life and the light of men. So enlightenment is found in Christ. Life for what it is is found in Christ. Everything else is not life and not light. It's some other variation of it. It's a variation of death. In fact, I will tell you this. The world around us are walking around like the walking dead. What do you mean? Well, if he's the light of men and we have life in Christ Jesus and you don't have Christ, what do you have? Death. There isn't another message. That is just the truth. As Christians, when we look at this text and we say, that is our God, he is the word, he created all things. And he's got a life. 
And it isn't the life that you have now. I don't know where you met Christ. I don't know where that happened for you individually, if you know him at all. But I can tell you, for me, it happened May 2nd, 1982. And when I met him on that day, when he stopped my life and decided he was going to bring the gospel to me and changed me forever, the life that I was on is not the life I kept. Thank God. All of a sudden, he says, you move from death to life. That's what he says. That's what the scripture says. And so in him is life, the real life, and life abundantly. And do not confuse that for riches, because that's not what that means. Life abundantly means that you are going to live the fulfilled life to what God has called you to do. And everything else falls short. We got here the same way. We preach the same gospel. We might go out differently. God may choose a life and a representation of him in you that is different a little bit from me. But the basis is the same. We serve the same God. And that's the piece, as I, if I want to encourage you about knowing your author, is really digging deep on the implications of that. Because if you're still walking a life that you have always walked and it's always been that way, you better question about where you're at with the Lord. Because in him is life, a life that this world does not offer. It offers something completely different. This world might offer you a lot of fun. Now, where I came out of in history in 1963, that's when I got here, I poked my head out of the dark space and looked around, and there was nothing but dysfunction all around me. There was bad perceptions of who God was. There was nothing but madness all around me. There was nobody who can point me to the truth, and it's only God's grace that calls me out of that darkness. And I can tell you, what I'm sharing with you is that author that God, that word, has the power to redirect foolishness, sin, darkness, and bring it into light. It says that he was the light of men. So you go back to Genesis in the beginning, and what happens is that God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created man. He created man in what? His own image. What? You go back and read that. That's what it says. He created us an image in what way? That we would reflect his character here on the planet and rule and deal with things. But then sin came in according to what it says. We messed it up because we tend to do that. But that wasn't a secret to God. That's where Jesus came. So let's go on with our text. He was the life, verse 4, and the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There's other translations that say it didn't comprehend it. Both are true. The light has shone, and he is the light, so he cannot be overcome. I don't know if you've ever been in a really dark room where all the lights are out, and then you just turn on a flashlight. For some reason, that flashlight dominates. You can see that in the darkness, because that's how light works. And he's giving us this example. He was a light that shone in the darkness. He is the light of men. He's the real light. He shines light on the things for our understanding. In him is life. In him is light. And the more you walk in Christ and the more you understand of who he is, the better you see what's really happening in the world. The life that you've been given is not one for self-pursuit, by the way. That is the other thing that God will begin to show you as you get to know his son even better is that he has a life set up for you he wants you to walk in. And it's probably not the one you've laid out. He wants to give you that life. He wants to give you the light so that you're enlightened so that you can begin to see how he wants you to walk because he has things for you to do. That's kind of really what it comes down to. He was that light and the darkness doesn't overcome it paul would later write in corinthians that when you talk about god's word when you talk about the cross when you talk about christ this world is backwards to them they don't get it in fact it says that the natural mind the secular mind the mind that is not spiritual one that is not enlightened by the word of god is constantly at enemy having enemy conflict with God in his word that's what it says that there is this conflict that your natural self fights against the things of God Paul would later write in Romans right he looks at himself and he says who can save me from this body of sin 
except Christ himself. Because he sees his own dirtiness as he sees Christ. That's the other thing, is as that light begins to illuminate you as a human being, you'll begin to see portions of yourself that God wants to deal with. And I'll encourage you this, don't look away. If this word is God, and this word is given to us as God's word for us, and it's to illuminate us for change, then if God is showing you something about yourself, I tell you, don't run from it. The other thing I would caution you to be careful with light is that light is also blinding. We have a tendency to do this to the world. Look at yourselves. You're dirty, all of you. Look how filthy this world is. Look how terrible and sinful it is. And the world's like, remember, this doesn't mean anything to them without illumination of the Holy Spirit. And I see lots of Christian groups running out to tell the world how wicked it is. Do you know that the scripture says that the Holy Spirit does that? That's his job. Ours is to preach the gospel. He will convict the world of sin. That's what it says. And we think, well, we're God's helpers. That's, he's going to do it through us. He's going to convict the world of sin because we're going to go tell them how sinful they are. Nope. Jesus would say in Matthew, judge not lest you be judged, right? Take the speck out of your eye before you go try to pull lumber out of, take the lumber out of your eye before you try to get the speck out of your brothers. That's what the scripture says. Why? Because illumination through the scriptures is supposed to change you. And it's supposed to change you so you're more like Christ reflecting his character. And as you start to do that, you'll start to see God work in your life the way he's supposed to. Very often we pray for our children, our grandchildren. Oh, Lord, keep them from this evil world. Keep them from the dangers of what's going on. Help them, Lord, in their quest and their knowledge of you or whatever, whatever our prayer is. But do we show them Christ? Do we example Christ to them? Do they know how much you love the Lord? Do your children understand who Christ is in your, in your world? It's not enough to just pray for them. You've got to show them Jesus. Yes, pray for them. Pray fervently for them. This is a dark world. But show them Christ. Because what did he say? When I'm lifted up, I'll draw men to myself. You want to see your family saved? You want to see the loved ones in a place where they know Christ? Live Jesus more. Show them Jesus more. Don't show them you. We don't look that good. I don't know if you know that. Jesus is way better. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The more you know Christ, the better you see yourself. Man's need to promote himself, and I say that generally as a species, we tend to do that. I don't know if you've noticed that. In fact, if you get trained in any kind of a way professionally, the one thing that they will try to tell you regularly is you have to promote yourself all the time. I'm in sales, so they tell, you know, you have to have a, a promotion about who you are. You have to try to tell people all about your life. You've got to sell you. I don't like selling me. I'm not that good of a sale, to be honest with you. You're not getting much. But Christ is everything. See, when it's, when it's Christ in me, that's a different thing. I'm not the light. I'm not. I don't want anybody. Li I'm not going to write a book. I don't want anybody lining up, meeting me. You're, trust me, you're wasting your, your 30 seconds of fame. There's nothing to meet. The author of the book I would like to introduce you to can change you forever. I might say something clever that might stick in somebody's head, and I've done that when I used to travel and do motivational stuff for kids in schools, but the truth is it's, it's pretty much emptiness. If you're not giving Christ's message, then it's empty. I don't want to clean the world up and make it more acceptable, by the way. I, when I look at it and I see the dirtiness and I see the darkness and I see the madness, I'm reminded of what I see here, that the light needs to shine in that darkness. And the way that that light shines in that darkness is through my example and through the love that I share that's in Christ, not telling them how dirty they are. They already know it. 
I knew I was dirty before I came to Christ. Nobody had to come tell me. I knew. I was absolutely convinced I was going to go to prison for the rest of my life or be killed before I was 25. That was my lifestyle. That's where I was headed, and I was fine with it. But God interrupted that life. He made a choice of something else. Paul would say this, is that when he looks at the, the cross, he's not ashamed of the cross. Why? Because it's the power it's the power of God to save. When we talk about the gospel, the good news, it starts with good news and bad news. The good news is God is light. God is life. God came for man. The bad news is we need him desperately and we can't do it on our own. This life is not just, this isn't all we got. And I want to encourage you to look beyond your circumstance right now beyond your life right now and understand that God has something larger and longer for you this whatever you're going through right now take your eyes off of it and put it on Jesus and watch what he starts to do as he becomes the light as you start to know him better and understand who he is John bore witness of him and I would say this we are to bear witness of him we're to share about what Christ has done for us. And it's not just telling you about the Bible. I could, I could tell you Bible stories and that's great. And that is important, by the way, I don't want to take that away. But also, the goodness of God. When I used to share my testimony before, I, it was because I couldn't stop myself because God was just so good. You don't understand what kind of darkness he took me from. And then when I was praying for my wife because she was lost and she was pregnant with my daughter, and I thought, Lord, I... My kids can't grow up without Christian parents. Now that I know you, please save her. No words that I had, by the way, could move Carmen towards Christ. Every day I would pray, Lord, please help her. And then she'd get up and tell me how much she hated me. <laughs> because we had that kind of relationship in the beginning. And two weeks before she, uh, before she gave birth to my daughter, she came forward at an altar call and gave her, gave her life to the Lord. And it had nothing to do with me. It was God's design all along. He desires to see us saved. He desires to take us from darkness into the light. It's his desire to see us move in the right direction. But he doesn't force you either. He waits patiently. God is patient. It's incredible. So here's the light. And a witness to the light. Verse 9, the true light which gives light to the world which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet they didn't know him. Isn't that crazy? He made everything, seen and unseen. He's the light of men. He gave life in the beginning where it says, God breathed life into man. He was that, that life. He was us. We were connected with God. But when he showed up, we missed it. We didn't recognize him. We didn't recognize him because he didn't show up as pretty Jesus. The image that we make of what Christ is supposed to look like. Do you know that in Isaiah 53, it gives a description of the Christ. And it said he doesn't look like anything you would think to look at. There was nothing about him that stood out that goes, oh, that really good looking guy must be God come in the flesh. Because, of course, God is going to make the perfect man and the most beautiful one to show himself off, right? No. It says he came as a servant. He came as the lowest form of human being that you can come as, and he showed up here. That's why we didn't recognize him, because our eyes are looking at the lofty. I want a God on a throne and one that's powerful, and who's going to make me a powerful person and a rich person and whatever. But that's not the God. We missed it because you missed who he was. People still miss it today because I think that there's a message introducing who Jesus Christ is that's not the gospel. Very often, we look at our children and we see their struggles and we go, oh, Lord, help them with their struggles, help them with their marriages, help them with their thing, whatever it is, or our grandchildren or our friends, but we're not saying, Lord, help them with your understanding of who you are because when they get that right, everything else will be okay. I stopped praying for my daughters and grandchildren's stuff for them to have. And Lord, show yourself to them 
because that will be far more powerful than anything I could give them or provide for them or make their life soft and comfortable. The light of men is Jesus Christ. He's the true light. And when he showed up, we didn't get it. Verse 11, he came to his own. From the beginning, Jesus was there. He helped create everything. And we think very often that from that beginning, he was there and then he went away and he waited until, you know, Matthew wrote about him and then he shows up in the New Testament. No, he was there all along. He's the angel of the Lord in Genesis that goes to Haggai and says, hey, don't worry, God's got this. He's going to take care of you. You're going to have lots of kids. Your son's going to be crazy and tells that story. He's the rock in the desert that Moses struck and they gave water to the people. He was always there all along showing himself until he was completely revealed in the New Testament, till he came. And it says that he came to his own people because in the beginning it says when after God created man and man messed up, he started singling out people that he was going to deal with. As one of those guys was Abraham. And he said to Abraham, I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to give you something special. You're going to bless the world. Your seed, not plural, singular, because he was prophesying about Jesus Christ, will bless the world. And so Abraham and his children were who God dealt with historically so we could see God's nature in writing through their history. And then when he came to his own, Jesus showed up as a Jew and said, Here I am, your Messiah. Everything that was written me that you have been studying about all your life is right here. And they missed him. He came to his own and his own. Not only did they not recognize him out of jealousy, envy, they killed him. They took his life. Verse 14. Oh, excuse me. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You're blessed if you grew up in a Christian household because you've been exposed, I would pray, to the gospel. But being born of some Christians doesn't necessarily just pass that on to you. You have to get to a place where you yourself have to go before God and say, am I one of yours? And deal with it individually. Because God does visit the household and he gives that promise and it's one I stand on with my children. I still tell my children, you have a responsibility to go before the God who knows you and figure out what your life is supposed to be. I'm not the one telling you how it's going to be. You still have to meet that God. You still have to receive him for who he is. But all who do receive him and believe on his name, he gives them the right to be called children of God. Verse 14, And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, John bore witness, and he cried out, This was he who said, He who comes before me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Salvation right there is not merited on anything you did. In fact, anything that you can put together that God has not led you to do that you think you're going to lay before him as a means of your own salvation is, ter is a terrible idea. You can't do it. There's nothing you can produce, nothing you can do. There's no level in which you can attain because that's what the world does. The world says we can become like God if we try hard enough, if we're virtuous enough, if we have enough rules, if we, if we live a certain way. No, it all comes short. If you don't have Christ, you don't have salvation. You don't have truth. You don't have the light. You're going to be misled. Amen. For from the fullness we have received grace upon grace. That's it. It's grace. Here's the crazier part. If you are saved, if you know Jesus Christ, if you have had that walk with him, don't pat yourself on the back so much because he even gave you the faith to believe. That's what the scripture says. 
He even did that. So when I start thinking, oh, I gave my life to Jesus, he must be proud. No, he even gave me the inclination to respond to him. That's how much I didn't bring to the table. It's grace. And the minute you go, the God of the universe who showed up here, became flesh, on my behalf, took my sin. Even gave me the faith to believe in him. That's amazing to me. I brought nothing. I brought nothing to the table. We have a relationship with God, a covenant in his blood, an agreement that I will reflect his character until the day I die and become more like him and less like me. That's, that's, our, that's our agreement. And he's given me salvation for no other reason other than he just chose to do it. I did nothing good, trust me. I didn't. I was a criminal. Yet God is gracious. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth, grace and truth, say that again, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Hebrews 1.3 says that he, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance and the glory, the exact imprint of God. Jesus, when he was talking with his disciples, they said, just show us the Father. And he turns around to him and says, have I been with you all this time that you can't see me? Jesus was the exact imprint of God. He is the third person of the Godhead, nothing less than God come in the flesh. And he's the one who gave his life for our sins. And in him is life. There is no other life outside of him. Anything else is cheating yourself out of what is true. And no one has seen God until they met Jesus. And nobody has seen Jesus until they met you. Yeah. God puts you in a place to represent Christ. We are made in his image from the beginning. That's what it says. And we're supposed to reflect God's image there. And we failed. And Christ came so that we could get that right. So that he is the light of men. He's the truth of men. And we're to reflect him in everything that we do. And when we fail to do that, we cheat the gospel. We cheat our family members. We cheat the people that are lost because we're giving them some other message. My encouragement to you is this. The declaration of what you make to the people around you about Christ is going to come powerfully if you tell them the truth. And it has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with great things that are happening or what you've achieved or what your accomplishments are. All of that's trash. What we have to stand in is Christ Jesus and him crucified on the cross. His love is so deep. His love is so great that the God of the universe suffered on my behalf. He, had, he didn't have to do that. He suffered on your behalf. He suffered for our children. He suffered for this community. He suffered for the people in the darkest places that we're repulsed by. His love is there. The question is, are we? My encouragement to you is this as we close up. Consider who you are in Christ. One, if you call yourself a believer, then I will challenge you to reflect Christ in your character, especially in this place, but even more so when we go out there. If you say, hey, you know what? I grew up in the church. Never really had that understanding. Then I would challenge you in this. You, to know Christ is to receive him in, to accept what he did, his sacrifice, and that he intends to live inside you forever. He wants to change you. He wants, and it's not just so you can have a better life. It's not the gospel of a better life. You're not going to come to Jesus and get better credit in a new house. That's not what this is. It's salvation. It's something greater. It's taken from your darkness, put into light, and all of a sudden you see truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these and Lord, I know that sitting in these pews are those that you call your own because I know them, Lord. They're here. They're always here. 
And Father, your grace is poured on their lives. And my prayer for them right now, Father, is that you'd fill them with your spirit. That, Lord, you would give them a love for you. And a love for the lost. Especially the lost around them. Father, I pray for our children that may not know you. I pray for our grandchildren who are confused by this world. I pray for those who are in darkness. And I ask you, Lord, that you would pour your light into their lives. But more that you would encourage these, us, sitting here together, to be your light, to reflect you, to show Jesus to everybody. And Lord, if there are any here who are confused about who you are, I ask that you would touch their lives, that you'd move amongst them. And Father, you would bring salvation by your grace, as you always do. And Lord, as we consider the beauty of the gift you gave us in Christ Jesus, may we not take it for granted, Lord. Use us with whatever time we have left on this earth for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name.